major finding was a 500 pound repeated entry in one company's accounts. I think that anyone who's read um, the 100 plus pages of the big report will realize that that is just quite an absurd statement. Let's go on to page 460. And in 460, the Defence Council says, 5.4, of particular importance is the fact of the small number of applications discussed in the external investigators report as of July 2014. The majority are still training. Well, I'm not allowed to name them, but that is um, a rather partial truth because two of them, by July 2014, of the original, are actually in liquidation. The successor company that is so triumphantly declared in the apologia within the executive summary by the council has also gone into liquidation by that date. So we do have a simple majority of four to two, but it's hardly something that one can trumpet. Of course, 5.5, the chief executive or the defense council says, by any accounts, therefore, the big scheme has had a positive effect on Riddle's economy and business community, creating and safeguarding jobs, and in most cases, providing businesses with the resources to expand their activities. Well, if I took a barrel load of cash out into the nearest uh, business enterprise centre and handed out 20,000 at a time, it's bound to have a positive effect. It's Keynesian economics. The question here is, was, were these businesses the correct people to receive the money? That is the pertinent question. And on that question, there are anomalies in all six companies. If I go on to page 466, which is the defense of the ISIS summary, at 3.3, the draft internal audit reports were not made publicly available at this point. They are talking about when they were suppressed in September 2012. And they go on to say, in order not to prejudice any possible future investigations into the complainant's concerns. Not has been suggested because the reports were critical of council officers. If anyone reads Dave Gary's report with my collation of um, the untruths in it, would say that it is actually damning that the Chief Internal Auditor, with free access to the Chairman of this committee, you simply have to read the Anna Kanowski report on internal audit, and with bi-monthly meetings with the Chief Executive, is quite simply outrageous that he took 13 months to come up with 13 pages on ISIS compared to something like 250 by Grant Thornton and 25 pages on BIG compared to 125 pages by Grant Thornton. If that isn't damning enough, consider Grant Thornton were met by myself and two other people in this room in November 2011, beginning. By mid-December, the chief lead investigator phoned me up and he said, I finished the big report. It took him less than a month. So we have the chief internal auditor taking 13 months to produce a highly imperfect report. If that isn't critical of council officers, and the people he associated with at the time, including the then chief executive, I don't know what is. Consider, he's written 13 pages on ISIS. He calls it a draft, and within those 13 pages are comments like, tax returns, must return to that later and answer it. And yet, at the end, he's come to his conclusion before he's even finished. 
it's a pathetic piece of work. And I think that the people there at the time should hang their heads in shame. And I also give you an example of while this was going on, I actually met with the chief executive, the former chief executive. I met with the head of law, and I met with Adrian Jones in the town hall. And you know what I was told? As the chief internal auditor was writing this whitewash, I was told by the head of law, we've referred it to the police, but they're not interested. That's a very interesting comment that at February 2012, when Dave Gowie supposedly is about to clear uh, himself, the council, his fellow officers, and indeed Will Pierce, that it should have been referred to the police. And later, in the summer, before he's finished, um, I'm told that David Armstrong reported it to the police as well. Well, clearly they weren't reading or corresponding in their bi-monthly meetings with a chief internal auditor. But of course, there's one other thing I've got to do as a prosecutor. I've got to string together a narrative, a thread, a motive, why this might have happened. It is very important to understand in this process that Grant Thornton are what you call an expert witness. Grant Thornton concatenate relevant and pertinent events quotations, sayings. That's what they do. They're not paid to say, this person is a dirty thing. And they think if you read through those hundreds of pages, you will not see Grant Thornton saying, Enterprise Solutions Northwest are a bunch of things. They don't say that. They don't say anything like that. They make recommendations. Everything is highly neutral. What is the reason for that? Well, currently, um, Grant Thornton are potentially being su sued by the Tainbury's brothers on a several hundred million pound lawsuit, probably for stepping out of line from their neutrality. So why would they, for 50,000 pounds, risk anything? If you won't risk, as a, as a corporation, if you won't risk naming businesses that might have robbed you, why do you think Grant Thornton is going to do the same? It's not irrelevant. It's kind of building up to something. It's not irrelevant. Now, the reason I quoted that, why they are a key witness, is because when you charge for forensic accounting, you charge many hundreds of pounds of an hour for the risk. So, when the defense counsel says proudly, we will quote three or four lines out of a 350-page report that says, for example, we have not identified any concerns regarding the integrity or honesty of council employees. That means exactly what it says. It means, doesn't mean that they've looked for it, doesn't mean that at all. What it means is they haven't identified. And this is the point I'm making. If you are charging £200 plus an hour, you have 250 hours in £50,000. We already know that Grant Thornton say they met with severe opposition from the lawyers. We know that they did not have a proper collection of documents when they arrived. We know that they asked the legal department repeatedly for the minutes of the meeting in the summer of 2011, where the then manager of the program asked to suspend the program. The manager of Investor Law, and I have spoken to that person, and this is in the report, asked which we must suspend this contract now. And that would have been six months before its cessation. Grant Thornton never received a reply. So, if I personally can account for 50 hours of Grant Thornton's time, and I'll explain how I can, the three whistleblowers went to Grant Thornton's office 
in early November. We met with two Grant Thornton employees. We were there for nearly six hours. That's two times six. That's 12 hours. Subsequently, we met with two, the two investigators in Isis White's house for something like six hours. So shall we add another 12 hours? That makes 24 hours. Then we've got the three days that they had the privilege to spend at Willow Mills. So we've got 18 hours times two, that's 36 hours. My God, we've already reached a quarter of the time allotted, and I haven't even begun to write 350 pages. I put it to you, in a legal sense, that not only did they say to us in November 2011, we will operate according to your list of queries. You'll see that in the appendices, in an Excel spreadsheet. You will not see any criticism or questioning of the morality or integrity of council officers in that list. Their comment was, we rely on the help of those officers. How can we try and investigate their morality and ethics at the same time? They did what any private firm would do. They circumscribed their investigation. And therefore, to the defense counsel, I say, fine, they found no questions of integrity and honesty, although I have, um, but which I shall outline later. But what they did find was a concatenation of events, papers, absences of scrutiny, it's riddled with it. If you look at the big fund report, you should come out with the impression that these people were not doing their job properly. Oh, yes, Could I ask you, can you kindly just stand back? Yes. Because it's just reading their big report would come to that conclusion. Because there they go interviewing an external panelist who says, I was never informed. I would have rejected it had I been informed. The question as to the integrity of officers appears on the listing that I've handed out. And it appears twice. On the second page, Referring to page. Well, I shall give him copy. The references are within your, um, your, your supposed redacted reports. Your redacted reports are not complete. There are many hints, and um, you, you let slip on multiple occasions the names of these companies. I emailed you about this in the last two weeks. Lockwood Engineering no longer exists. It's no longer a legal person. You should know that, I think. Noah's Harbach UK Limited. They're both no longer legal persons. If they go into liquidation, they're no longer legal persons. But anyway, let's go back to before I was interrupted. Um, 
on page, nine, uh, on page 19, that's the second page of here, um, it says, I quote, there was no evidence of deception. Now, I must make a comment. This was given that the cash flows for Company 4, we'll call it Company 4, cash flows for Company 4 predicated a need for the big grants, which is a vital condition. Then I go to Grant Thornton's full big report at 5.14. And I must couple that with the balance sheet that I actually sent to all the committee members, all the committee heads uh, in the last few days. This is a balance sheet for December 2009 for Company 4. From the, the officer's financial appraisal, Grant Thornton, quote, Current and assets and liabilities were approximately in balance at 103,000 and 104,000 respectively. But this leaves little capacity in terms of cash availability. Those numbers which you did not redact, you'll find them on page 521, are completely and utterly untrue. And you have the accounts. They have bear no relationship. The seeming objective on the face of it is to try and persuade the panel member, the external panel member, to agree to the, an application which was already shaky because it breached the local competition rules. Mr. Hogrove, at the start of the meeting, I gave you 15 minutes. That was eight minutes past it. When, when, when we spoke in the past, on the 27th of July, you said there was no limit. No, no. You did say that. You did say that. Just no. Yeah. Um, what you're you trying to do is... Let me finish. I said, uh, it's now 8, 18, 28, so you have 20 minutes. Can you start again? Round and off, please. I hold you in contempt for that. So, basically, I shall address the public in another forum. If you wish to ask me questions, then... You can't hold me in contempt to tell me, so you please wait for some of Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for very little, Chairman. I didn't ask you to finish. Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Yeah. You sit in the pub, he could talk all night. No, I did not. You soft. Don't, don't. They're just liars. <sighs> Have you got much more yet? I haven't got much more. We've waited three and a half years for this. Really? Yes. All right, okay. Um, you obviously enjoy interrupting me, um, but I shall try and carry on for a little bit longer. The second uh, evidence of um, unethical behaviour is again in my list. And this concerns the head of regeneration. And it is referenced at page 25. The successor, successor company is Harvard UK Limited, which, you know, which is in the relation. He said to James Griffiths at the meeting of the 5th of July, no big recipient has gone lost. Dave Gary says, there is evidence that KA, I think we can guess who that is, was aware that the original company had continued in existence following this transfer. There is no evidence that KA was aware that the original company had gone into liquidation. He dates this as March 2011. By the 14th of April 2011, within the statutory two weeks of passing a resolution to 
credits its voluntary winding it up. That company was preparing and submitted an affidavit of an insolvent company. So what you're asking myself to believe is that the head of regeneration approved the transfer of 30,000 pounds of assets out of the insolvent company into the new company without the liquidator, and I had a chat with Begby's trainer, without the liquidator being ever aware of those assets. And then one has to question, why did he do that? Perhaps it would not be a leading uh, proposal to say that perhaps that it wasn't the public interest. What was at stake was the discovery of the terrible mistakes made on the Lockwood cash flow and the, and the financial appraisal. It was highly embarrassing to him. That is my second piece of evidence. It's very hard to get these kind, this kind of evidence without close reading. But anyway, I refute what um, the Defence Council says. What this, my final words are, what this is really about is not a criticism of the councils. If you are given misleading statements by officers, you have no way to check them. We have electricians, retired teachers in this room. They're not all financial experts. So they must take whatever they're given. I'm going to show you how I color-coded 20 pages of Dave Gary's report. Those are misleading statements and lies. That's in 20, well actually that's the ISIS as well, that is in 33, 35 pages. We haven't got time to go through them all. But I would like to mention one last thing, and this is on page 391. To 393. This is, if you like, the original sin. In it, and the person is named and not redacted, David Ball, the executive manager of regeneration, it's on page 393. He goes into a discussion as to who should be awarded the contract for working with them. There was a hiatus for two and a half years to March 2007, from October 2004. He lists three quotes. Enterprise Solutions Northwest Limited, designated associates, and Social Enterprise Network, all named in this report. He says, in the, in the resume that he gives to councillors, Enterprise Solutions are currently active work, actively working in a business start centre and are delivering a number of these programmes for other clients. They have at least 10 years' experience of delivering these programmes. Enterprise Solutions Northwest Limited was incorporated on the 13th of May, 2002, just over two years before. If you download the accounts, and I have provided it to the chief members of this committee, you'll see that there is no evidence within the accounts that, grant, that um, Enterprise Solutions has done any work for anyone else at all. In fact, the only year that they've got a trade debtor is the year to December 2004, three months after receiving the contract. The, the amount of that debtor is exactly the invoices that were invoiced to Widow Barrett Council. I'm going to allow another five minutes to uh, sum up. Obviously, all prosecutors must come up with an impact statement. What is the impact of this wonderful program? Well, I'm going to quote you four examples. I won't name them. ISIS-1 appears in the Grant Thornton report. ISIS-1 lost a substantial amount of money 
and time in his business. He lost that time and money because he was given advice both from the council about a council building, council officer, and also from a named person, Matt Marlon, an advisor at Enterprise Solutions, that his license to occupy would be converted into a full lease. He also received the same advice from a charity that occupied this, um, that acted as managing agent for this building. That advice was totally untrue. So for a man and his family who invested 35,000 and enormous amounts of time into a business for a franchise that they couldn't sell because they relied on, oh, it's copper bottomed. Little Beers is, is backed by the council. Council. That was a terrible mistake. You will know to add insult to injury that for two and a half hours work, Little Beers charged the uh, ERDF fund £1,144 for incorrect advice. The second person was a 50-year-old, happily married, with a very small software company. He unfortunately entered the toils of Willow Biz and their bookkeeping scheme. His real tax bill, by the time it was done correctly, was 800 As a result of Willow Biz, he collected county court judgments and a £22,000 estimated bill. What was the effect on this man? He had a stroke. The stress was so much, he had a stroke with the difficulties of dealing with all of this. My third example was a 16-year-old girl who was advised by Whittle Biz under your working Whittle program that she could form she could open a little boutique in Berlin Market selling penny sweets and chocolate bars. The business plan predicted hundreds of thousands of pounds of turnover. The girl was an impressionable girl and she borrowed ten thousand pounds off her aunt and promptly lost it and faced investigation for tax and incredible difficulties. I received the phone call from her aunt who told me about it. She said, who is responsible for this business plan? I said, not me, but it is disgraceful. The last one is mentioned in one of the three files that Grant Thornton are able to look at from the pre-ISIS period. And you've got to remember there must be 1,500 files in that period, and they were able to look at three. Pisces three. Pisces three suffered from dyslexia. Pisces three ended up with county court judgments for failing to file accounts, which were promised under the Willowbeer's accounting scheme. Not least as an impact statement is my friend James Griffiths, who, well after leaving Willowbeer's, because of the stress that you put him under and the failure to obtain justice, was in hospital with cellulitis in October 2012. For myself, my dentist tells me that I suffered 20 years of erosion of my teeth in two years between the two x-rays, simply because we wanted justice, but you wouldn't give it to us. What is the impact statement on future whistleblowers? Well, anyone who looks at this case in future counsel when most of your services will be outsourced. What employee of an outsourced company is ever going to tell you about fraud? You've set this back 20 years. My summation. I would ask you, I would plead with you to reject the defense counsel's, counsel's motions that this was a generally successful um, program. Even if you were to say, use the Scottish formula, unproven. Unproven. This may be too much to ask of you. I would also ask you to go further and to rebuke the officers for their misleading statements, their loss of the contracts, their loss of um, 
the CRM database, then negligence in the big affair and in the ISIS 